India, a crowded little finger of land extending out of Asia's mainland, pointing significantly toward Japan and the Pacific beyond. A nation not much larger than our state of Minnesota, but acre for acre, one of the most violently mountainous areas on Earth. Today, the capital city, Seoul, is largely restored, rising from the rubble of almost total destruction to become at least somewhat like her old self. The Capitol building wears a new dome, but nothing short of complete rebuilding will ever erase the battle scars in these walls. As Koreans today know it, the peace is an uneasy armistice in a divided nation. But with the dogged stoicism of a culture 4,000 years old, they go about the business of living, knowing as they do that for the living, there is no other course. In the markets, the scrap pile school of architecture prevails, but business is as colorful, noisy, and aromatic as it ever was. North of Seoul, the mountains rise in sharp volcanic disorder. Green foliage has returned to slopes once blasted bare by TNT and napalm, but at the summit, eyes still keep watch to the north. Along the demilitarized zone, or DMZ, entrenched forces face one another across no man's land. Here, the armistice decreed, the armies would pull back from one another, forming a buffer zone among the mountains. Once again, Korea, the ancient mountain kingdom of Chosen, is in fact the land of the morning calm. But no one forgets June 25th, 1950. It was still dark, four o'clock on a Sunday morning. South Korean villages awoke to a world suddenly filled with noise and flames. The communists, made whole by months of small-scale raiding across the 38th parallel, had finally launched their undeclared all-out war of conquest. Half a world away in Washington, President Truman took immediate action, saying, In these circumstances, I have ordered United States air and sea forces to give the Korean government troops cover and support. Next day, at the United Nations in New York, United States Representative Warren Austin made our position clear beyond doubting. The armed invasion of the Republic of Korea continues. The Republic of Korea has appealed to the United Nations for protection. I am proud to report that the United States is prepared to furnish assistance to the Republic of Korea. Spearheaded by tanks, the Red Forces had moved swiftly. In two days, they were attacking the capital city itself. Seoul fell the next day, June 28th. By June 30th, the Communists had crossed the Han River south of Seoul and fought through the rail city of Yongdong-po. With their heavy Russian-made tanks, they thrust aside South Korean resistance racing down the corridor which led through Hanyang towards Suwon. Here the helpless and homeless gathered, only to be told they must flee still farther southward. Everywhere they saw their outnumbered countrymen rushing north to join the battle. Less than a dozen combat planes were available, several of them piloted by Americans. The Korean-American Volunteer Group but little you could do with only 10 aircraft, we did. Even as the Red Armor swept towards Suwon, advanced elements of the 24th Infantry Division were being airlifted to Korea from Japan. coming was known to the people. 
they were welcomed with cheering. Four days later, they met the enemy south of Osan, and the cheering was forgotten. Man, I was scared. I didn't know it was going to be like that. The enemy was a lot stronger and better trained than we'd heard. Some guys thought we'd have it easy. It didn't work out that way. Retreat. The few heavier weapons covered each withdrawal as best they could. Where they had divisions, we had companies. Pull back, fight, pull back again. Four days and nights, nobody slept. We started with a good many green troops. Now anybody could still pack his gear, he was a veteran. Yokota Air Base, Japan. Our first large-scale bombing attack is mounted as more than 50 B-29s take off. The target, one south, key North Korean port city. We wondered how much attack there'd be. There wasn't any at all. Communists moved south toward Tejon. We pulled back across the Kum River. This natural barrier offered another chance to buy time from the enemy. We took advantage of it. The Air Force was playing a leading role in our attempt to delay the communist advance. Lacking bases in Korea, F-80 jets adapted oversized wing tanks for the long flight across the Sea of Japan. Angel fire to Dofoot, over. Dofoot to Angel 5, request fire on enemy column due north, your position. Angel fire to Dofoot, receive your transmission, we'll proceed, over. Dofoot to Angel 5, good luck. Japan. A Navy task force approaches the east coast of Korea. Destination, Oha. Mission, to land the men and machines of the 1st Cavalry Division. The Korean battle line was moving rapidly on all fronts. Only on arrival were the troops informed 
that the landing would be unopposed. The division's 27,000 men started ashore. Psychology says how you're supposed to feel sort of disappointed. Expect to fight and then don't have to. Maybe so. I wasn't disappointed. On July 20th, the Reds reached Pejah. 24th Division troops led by General Dean were to hold as long as possible. There was something fishy about you, John. I mean, they threw in a little artillery and then we waited. Nothing. Nobody. Then wham, they were all over the place. We found out we were surrounded. It was a case of move out fast and stay put for good. As it was, we were going to have to make a run down a corridor of fire a mile long, which we did. We had bought more tires, but Ted John was gone, and with her, General D. We traded time for space, two weeks for the land between Ted John and the Nakhtong River. From behind the wide, deep waters of the Nakhtong, we could test our growing strength. We cut the bridges and poured our fire on the opposite bank. Daily communist attacks probed up and down the length of the line, searching for an opening. Daily we settled upon those attacks, all the firepower at our command. The line ended. In the north and eastern sectors, ROK troops had recovered from the first shattering blows they had taken. They would retreat no more. Where tanks are concerned, Korea is no place to have a war. There's only two directions up the hill and down the hill. And that perpendicular terrain puts armor in a straitjacket. Still, you do what you can. With a little added elevation, a tank's rifle can be darn and good artillery. We found a way to get that extra elevation. It works fine. General William Keane received orders to carry out our first large-scale offensive action. The enemy was trying to punch through in the south and capture Pusan. Task Force Keane, composed of General Keane's 25th Division, the 5th RCT, and the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade, was to repel this attack. It was the 6th of August. I remember, of course, that's my birthday. Also, it's the first time I ever got shot at. I remember thinking to myself, happy birthday, Charlie. The word came down. Time to move again. We had to get to high ground. There's a base of fire. The armor took charge of the low ground. And from the ridge line, sparked by the Marine Brigade, which soldiers unleashed their fire? Methodical, concentrated, gentle. The Marines, equipped with a heavy bazooka, found it highly effective against Russian-made armor. a sturdy, dangerous task. To clear the area of red snipers and stragglers. For veterans of the Pacific, the action was painfully familiar. Like the Japanese, a small-bodied North Korean soldier had a talent for hiding behind a bush no larger than you might grow in a window box.
Task Force team took its quota of prisoners. Many had shed their uniforms, hoping to escape in the white civilian clothes worn underneath. At close quarters, the enemy lost his fearsomeness. Usually, he was very young. Always, he was glad to be out of the fighting. Task Force Keen had earned a brief moment in which to catch its breath. Busan Harbor, August 29th. The first non-American troops to join the UN forces in Korea arrived from Hong Kong. Two battalions from the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders and the Middlesex Regiment. Well, as joint troops, we was happy to reach Korea. The past six months, we'd been sweltering in Hong Kong. Then it's so blooming hot, we were scared to dig a hole for fear we'd bust right through in the hell. At least over here, we'd be cool enough so the man could enjoy his blinking tea time. September 1st. An all-out red offensive across the Noctong tightens our circle of defense. The siege of the Fusan perimeter is on. In the sea of Japan, Task Force 77 carriers speed up their operations. job to send them out. Every available aircraft, every usable minute of every day. Our enemy had long, vulnerable supply lines now. Without adequate stocks of ammunition and fuel, his strength would fail. With luck, we'd make sure. our strength was mounting daily, even as the Red Armies were dissipating their own. Food, ammunition, supplies, all the tools of war were being stockpiled. Our days on the defensive were nearing an end. On September 15, 1950, the UN forces take the offensive. An assault fleet appears off Walmy Island at Incheon Harbor, 150 miles behind enemy lines. It's a daring end-run maneuver, which takes the sleeping enemy completely by surprise. At 0630 hours, the Marines begin the assault. The naval barrage has cleared the way for them, but this is still a risky operation. Headquarters must gamble on the first try being good. In some violent 30-foot tides, leave no time for a second attempt. We had orders to neutralize resistance and do it fast. Dig them out and cover up the hose. More Marines move into the streets of Incheon itself. They meet little resistance, and within hours, the city is secure. The big gamble has paid off. With the surrender of Incheon's modern harbor, the back door to Seoul is opened wide. Simultaneously in the south, the reinforced 8th Army breaks out of its Busan stronghold, splitting the encircling red forces as it thrusts across the Naktong River to begin its drive northward. In Chon, the 7th Infantry Division swarms ashore to strengthen the UN foothold in the north. Thousands of enemy troops are being trapped in the southwest, 
as the Busan Spearhead races north to join up with Incheon forces. On the way to Seoul, we took a good many prisoners, too. But they didn't come in. is growing in the north. Men and machines, first hundreds, then thousands, flow inland from the sea to join the attack towards Seoul. With each step, however, they meet stiffening resistance as the retreating enemy consolidates his forces. At Busan, still another nation joins the growing UN command as 1,200 men of a cracked Philippine regimental combat team come ashore. And at Kimpo Air Base, south of Seoul, men of the 187th Airborne Regiment arrive from Japan to become the first paratroop unit to enter the conflict. This newly recaptured airfield has also become an advanced base for increased air attacks on the enemy's supply and escape routes. The spearhead from Busan gathers momentum. Columns of transport barrel northward against a disheartened enemy. In many towns, the entire populace turns out to shout its welcome. It was like France all over again. Couldn't understand what these people were saying either. Some places, nobody was around to say anything. It's only about 20 miles from Inchon to Seoul, paved highway all the way. But it took us a week of hard fighting to make the trip. Finally, though, our amphibious gear, crammed full of rock and American Marines, started massing up at the Han River across from Seoul. It was time to retake the city. The softening up process got underway. River crossing means a full-scale amphibious operation, since the Han here near its mouth is well over a mile across. The Reds who had thrown back an earlier night attack were gone, pulled out to dig in among the streets of Seoul itself. The battle for Seoul was rough. 10,000 communist troops garrisoned every building and street junction with orders to fight to the death. Great many did. The shattered city is retaken September twenty sixth. During the battle for Seoul, the trap is closing swiftly about red forces in the southwest. The day after Seoul falls, troops from the 7th and 1st Cavalry Divisions join up just south of Suwon. Two days later, in the battered Capitol building, special ceremonies are held as General MacArthur officially returns the city to Syngman Rhee, President of the Republic of Korea. begins a tragic homecoming for the thousands who had fled the city only three months before. You look at these people, scratching through the ashes of what used to be their homes, wonder where they got the guts to go on. So I guess we do the same back home if it came to that. As 
life begins to take root again in Seoul, the UN advance in the eastern sector goes on. On September 30th, Ross forces reach the 38th parallel. They cross it the following day. One old guy couldn't keep it straight who was who. Turned out to meet the Rock Army with North Korean flags. The end of September finds the war back where it started. But the cost has been great. On October 6th, at a UN cemetery between Seoul and Incheon, Major General O.P. Smith, 1st Marine Division Commander, honors Marine dead. Representing the Army is Major General David Barr, 7th Division Commander. Korean troops are honored by Colonel Park in Yip, commanding the Rock 17th Regiment. The silent thanks and admiration of each commander for what his men have given is echoed by the people who owe their freedom to that willing sacrifice. Elsewhere, the conflict goes on without let up. B-29 squadrons based in Japan and on Okinawa continue their daily blasting of red industrial and transport centers in the north. Russia was a funny situation. A commuter's war, somebody called it. You'd eat breakfast with your wife and kids, spend the day over some rail center or factory or harbor, and head back home to sleep in your own bed at night. Funny situation.